You know, it's great to have uh, people in the field uh, that we're so interested in as amateurs. It's great to have uh, professionals come in and, and tell us the real story and, and help us understand a little bit more about the physics in some cases. Um, you know, for this particular one, I'm interested in the engineering, <laughs> but, but I know uh, the science is great too. So uh, it's really uh, great to have you, Kelly. Uh, Dr. Cork is uh, comes to us from NASA headquarters, I believe, is where you are currently currently yes yep and uh she spent a number of years studying the sun uh as you can see there on the slide and and most recently uh, uh several years helping to design one of the payloads maybe multiple payloads on the, on the parker probe and that's taken her all over the world working with uh like professionals and uh it's a it's a really cool mission and we're so pleased to have you uh explain it to us and share some of your knowledge uh, Dr. Korak uh, got her PhD from University of Michigan, and uh, uh, I understand you like to dance and like to hang out at the beach, which uh, I think Michigan has beaches, don't they? A few? <laughs> yes, yes, we're the mid coast. We, four, four out of the five Great Lakes prefer Michigan. <laughs> there you go. All right. So, Kelly, appreciate it. And uh, for all of us here, if you have questions for Kelly, like we usually do, we, we'll uh, have you type them in the chat box and uh, we'll, we'll take them at the end. Uh, so I'll hand it over to you, uh, uh, Kelly. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for inviting me to come talk um, about my favorite spacecraft. And now that I'm at headquarters, um, and actually one of my colleagues is also here um, in, in part of the group, is I can't have favorites, but I do. Um, Parker Solar Probe uh, is my favorite spacecraft. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I have been in the field for over 20 years. Um, started uh, my uh, started designing things when I was working on a rocket. This is me um, in a clean room with the high C, um, uh, the high resolution coronal imaging mirror that uh, flew on the high uh, on the high C sounding rocket. Um, I'm inspecting a uh, something that ended up uh, getting on the mirror, and we needed to uh, to clean it again. Um, and so we launched sounding rockets for about a five a chance for around a five minute. Um, collection of data um, on your target. And so this is the this is me next to high C as it's mounted. High C is the is the gold plated, um, not gold plated, but gold colored um, part of the rocket there. And so these were launched out in White Sands, uh, New Mexico, and at the time took the highest resolution um, images of this of the sun's corona or outer um, atmosphere. My work has um, taken me uh, many different places and I've worked with lots of different people and you might recognize one of those people um, right here standing in front of these esteemed colleagues um, at a Hanode meeting and then I'm uh, standing right behind one of your esteemed colleagues. Um, and so I really enjoy working the world uh, worldwide um, with different folks in solar physics. So I worked on the Hinode spacecraft, which is pictured over here on the left. Um, it's the X-ray telescope um, down here. George has worked. Uh, George Dushek has worked on uh, ICE, the uh, Extreme Ultraviolet Imaging Spectrometer. Um, I worked on uh, Hubble data, Chandra data. Um, as well as doing some calibration and data analysis on the atmospheric imaging assemblies on the um, Solar Dynamics Observatory, which take a picture of the sun every uh, 12 seconds and was downloading 1.7 terabytes of data a day um, to keep a constant eye on the sun um, in order to really revolutionize our understanding of it. So. I also spend a lot of time um, talking to the public and communicating the science that we do, both for Parker Solar Probe and astronomy and physics in general um, in a variety of different places. This happens to be at the House of Representatives um, where I was doing a monthly series um, on educating those in, um, those in leadership there. So other things about me, love the beach as was mentioned. Um, I'm a certified yoga instructor and I, that's that's where I was on retreat this this weekend. My other job, my other other job. Um, I love chocolate. You can bribe me with cupcakes, red velvet cupcakes as well. I can I can easily be bribed with? Um, and love my my cat uh, who might make an appearance since uh, she really normally likes to come into Zoom calls every once in a while. Um, so turning to the subject at hand, um, the sun. You know, why do we spend all this time, energy, effort? Um, studying it. Um, and one of the reasons is that it gives us so much. It gives us food, 
Um, it gives us these amazing beaches. Again, the theme here is beaches. I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm a summer person. Um, all these beautiful beaches, warm, warm weather. It also creates these amazing things um, such as the Aurora. So if we were uh, lucky enough in the last uh, few weeks, there was an X-class flare that created Aurora um, kind of in the, in the Northern hemisphere. And um, it is these beautiful dancing Northern lights that excite oxygen and nitrogen in the atmosphere from all the energetic particles coming off of the sun that then get trapped in the magnetosphere, come down to the atmosphere and create these beautiful sheets. Um, so I've had the privilege of seeing them um, in person uh, over a snowy Michigan in 2000 and um, hope again to one day see them soon. So observing in the sun also has a very long history. These are some drawings or what's considered some of the first drawings of sunspots. Um, this is the sun, um, dark, uh, dark features on the sun as uh, in sunspots in uh, I think 1100. Then a slightly more modern day in the 18, uh, 1800s. These are just absolutely gorgeous uh, drawings um, by Langley um, of sunspots and looking at these dark features and then the lighter um, basically fibrils or, or what looks like almost hair or fingers um, coming into them. And so this seems to be a very different thing than what we're used to on earth. And the sun is magnetically dominated. And, and these are basically like if you played with the iron filings when you were young, um, the, the material there is following those magnetic fields. So with modern imaging, um, this is what you could see um, on a on a sun, and and we saw a lot of this during during the early two thousands of a very blank sun with maybe a sunspot on it, and then zooming in, you see those same some of those same features that you saw um, in the Langley um, in the Langley uh, drawing um, of these of these sunspots and these magnetic uh, focused magnetic activity regions. Now, in the birth of modern um, modern telescopes and space-based telescopes, we do something now to observe the sun where you black out the center. So this, the sun size is the white circle um, in these images. The blue um, is an occulter so that you black out the um, so you black out some of the light of the sun and are actually then able uh, to see particles streaming off. So all those particles that create um, create the aurora um, and are part of a solar wind, as well as these massive explosions. Um, these coronal mass ejections range from around um, three to five a week during solar minimum, which we are just coming out of, to three to five a day during solar maximum, um, which we're heading into in 2023, 2024. Um, these coronal mass ejections, these massive explosions, um, can be the equivalent of 80 million school buses, um, the mass of 80 million school buses coming at the earth at millions of miles an hour. So this is a lot of energy um, and it becomes very important as we become really a spacefaring people, um, going to the moon, going to Mars, um, you know, having assets in different locations, we really do need to understand when these are happening. And just to give you a little bit of scale, this is the Earth, this blue, uh, this little blue marble up here. And this is about a quarter of the sun and one of those pieces of a filament eruption. Um, image, the, the Earth is not this close. Um, the, uh, this image is from uh, the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly or the AIA on SDO. Um, and so again, these beautiful filaments, um, bunch of mag uh, material um, controlled by the magnetic field there is being ejected and the earth is very, very small in comparison. Um, so these are very large, um, large effects and they've gone on for um, really for as long as the sun has, um, has existed. Um, and right now, one of the reasons why they're so important to study is simply because of our technology. Um, our technology is, um, is what the sun most interferes with. And so hence, that is why it's so important to study these uh, studying this right now. The Parker Solar Probe, it's actually it was 60 years in the making. Um, and so why would we do something um, like this is first of all, we're explorers. Um, and then again, those practical matters that I was 
um, describing about living with um, the star that we have uh, nearest to us. And then the scientific curiosity, there's a lot of very interesting physics that we're getting at uh, while we're um, going in this close to Parker. Um, so, and this, uh, the Simpson Committee report was the report that suggested Parker Solar Probe. It also created NASA, um, and it suggested visiting every body in the solar system. And up until this point, we had visited every other body in the solar system until, Par and then Parker was the last one to go into the sun. There are various incarnations of solar probe over the over the last 60 years. And really it came down to, I know Paul mentioned that he was interested in the engineering, is that it came down to the engineering was finally up to up to the task at this point in time. And they we found an orbit, um, orbit pattern that was able to, or trajectory that was actually able to give us more than one pass into the sun. As much as we really tried to figure out how to finally and end the mission in uh, by diving into the sun it takes a lot of energy to actually dive into the sun. Um, and uh, past missions were designed such that you'd only get one pass. So, you know, if your instrument didn't turn on, you would not get data. So this has been redesigned that there are 25 passes getting gradually closer and closer until closest approach will be in, uh, in 2025. So uh, that was the that was the uh, things that needed to happen um, for the last sixty years in order to make Parker Pro Parker Solar Probe a reality. So space weather, um, talking about this this practical matter of living with a star. Um, our uh, our star, the sun, is a middle aged sun, a uh, middle aged star that throws temper tantrums and uh, they drive the space weather. And space weather is everything that happens um, that, uh, that the sun's activity causes, um, the effects that they cause as, as it goes, as it travels through the earth and beyond or to the earth and beyond. And the three main parts of space weather drivers are solar flares. So these are these massive eruptions, um, magnetic explosions on the sun. Um, the, the amount of power generated by these by a, a flare could power the U.S. power grid for 80,000 years. So this is a lot of energy um, that these flares have. And the largest flares are associated with coronal mass ejections. So those millions of tons of material, those 80 million school buses at millions of miles an hour being um, ejected towards the Earth or Moon or Mars or whatever direction uh, they come from on the sun. And then leading the charge is actually solar energetic particles. Um, the solar energetic particles are energetic enough that they can take um, almost just an hour, uh, just an hour uh, to get to Earth because they're 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 they are traveling very very quickly. Um, these are what can cause uh, a variety of damages uh, in different situations, um, but as well as it can also cause the beautiful aurora. So an image of the effects of space weather. Um, so as these things, as the, the energetic particles, the coronal mass ejections propagate towards the Earth, what can happen um, is the solar flare protons can um, interfere with uh, or create radiation effects on avionics, um, damage to spacecraft electronics uh, through the uh, energetic electrons as well as protons. Um, you can induce ionospheric currents, um, you can uh, and induce um, power grid uh, currents in the power grid, uh, which would cause, uh, which could cause uh, blackouts um, and estimated if it were to happen on the eastern seaboard, uh, that could be trillions of dollars worth of downtime. And so it's very important to, again to figure out when when these things are going to happen and and how we can mitigate because we can mitigate all these effects um it just simply needs to be known ahead of time um and you know we're still uh, about 20 years off of where terrestrial weather is um so you know we don't have the ability right now to say tell uh the power grid to brown out so that they don't get this they don't go get these um induced currents um, to brown out New York City. Um, so, you know, we don't want to be wrong at that point in time. So a lot of work is going in um, to really understanding uh, these these flares and their effects on the on the earth and our electric and our technology so that we are able to be prepared. 
so that's one reason that really understanding it at the base, the scientific basis, uh, Parker is um, is flying through a lot of that um, on a regular basis and and, uh, and starting to understand those uh, those questions. Um, and the second part is scientific curiosity. The sun is still mysterious, and it does at least two weird things um, that we're still trying to figure out. It actually does a lot more, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep it to two um, for this talk. Um, so first of all, it has a reverse campfire effect. So if you think of the campfire, the heat is generated by the, um, the flames and by the burning of wood. But as you walk away from the campfire, um, you're going to get colder and you're going to, to, feel, um, to feel less heat. And that's simply because you're, you've walked away from the heat source. Well, with the sun, um, the heat source would be considered the nuclear fusion that's going on in this in the center of the sun. And as you as you progressively get further away from that heat source, you would expect it to get cooler, and you do. So that that yellow that you see of the sun um, in the early earlier images, the photosphere um, is cooler is is uh, is only around five thousand degrees where when you get to the corona, it jumps up then to a million degrees. So you've walked away from your heating source and you've actually gotten colder uh, or you've gotten warmer, sorry. And, um, and because you get warmer, this is what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out why that the core is around 16 million. You go up to the photosphere again, which is around 6,000. And then out in the uh, corona, it goes, it becomes over a million degrees. So you've walked away from that heating source and gotten gotten warmer. So we are trying to understand whether it's a series of um, these flares, that little little of these flares that constantly heat the corona, whether um, it's waves, and um, there are a couple of of different competing. Um, Competing theories that we hope to use Parker to help um, to help uh, understand which one or, or determine which one is is the source. Um, so what I'm showing here on the left is an image um, from the Atmospheric Imaging Assembly again, the AIA and SDO, um, and you're you're seeing these kind of uh, dancing uh, of the uh, of the magnetic field, the plasma that's caught in the magnetic field, and one of the ways that um, it's thought that the plasma is heated is in this cartoon version on the right. So you have the surface of the sun is this white line um, and you have things uh, dancing and shaking or, or convecting um, underneath to actually move the magnetic field. These are, are simulations of magnetic field um, and that is supposed to cause the heating. And you can kind of see these things again, um, dancing around here um, that that might be one of the signs of heating. Another um, theory on on what the um, the heating is, and this is actually from no, this is a, this is AIA as well. Um, I thought it was XRT, but it is AIA. Um, is it through these little flares and these this reconnection. And so watching this movie, you'll see that as the flare goes off, you'll start to see brightening, which um, can be correlated with heating. Um, and the cartoon version is the surface of the sun. Here's one loop. It uh, interacts with this other magnetic field causing the explosion and causing that heating. So those are two of the things that, uh, two th current theories of how the uh, coronal heating is happening. So now for Parker. Um, to orient us, we have Earth, Venus, Mercury, and the Sun. Um, our, the first closest approach was uh, just inside in, inside Mercury. Um, we launched, and then again, twenty five different um, passes. And so, once we get there, we had to design um, design something <laughs> that was going to um, that was going to do the work of of really understanding what we wanted to, what we wanted to solve, that coronal heating, the constant solar wind that was blowing off, the coronal mass ejections, things like that. And so sometimes you use models such as this, that we, uh, it, this was early days um, when we were using leftovers from lunch <laughs> to create spacecrafts. And we actually did a pretty good job, I think. Um, but we, uh, we definitely wanted to make sure that we had something to, to take the temperature because that's what we, um, what we've been puzzled about. Um, something like an anemometer who looking at the wind direction and speed. 
um, looking for magnetic fields because we said the, the plasma was magnetically dominated. Um, so a, a magnetometer um, as well as pictures because, you know, everyone, uh, everyone wants a good picture when they go on vacation and, and bring them home to uh, bring them home to others. So what I was involved in was the solar wind electrons, alphas and protons or the sweep suite. Um, and that consists of the Parker solar, uh, the solar probe cup, which actually peaks around the heat shields. It um, withstands over a thousand degrees in temperature and measures, um, could measure things uh, down to femtoamps. Um, so this is a very sensitive yet, um, yet sturdy cup. Uh, the other part of the suite, um, it measures uh, protons uh, and electrons, but stays mainly in proton mode at this point in time. Um, the solar probe analyzer B for, uh, for behind uh, sits over here and uh, measures electrons. Then the solar probe analyzer AI and solar probe analyzer AE are both an electron and an ion sensor that um, is ahead. So the spacecraft actually runs this way um, for ahead and then behind um, behind the spacecraft is B. So we were very creative with those names. Um, and uh, the other, th let me see if I have a, nope. Okay, let's go back. Um, the other things on the on the spacecraft, uh, these mag there's a magnetic field boom here, um, electric antennas out front for measuring. There is Whisper, which is the picture taker down here. And there is ESIS, um, which is the energetic particle detector, um, is this bubble next to uh, next to the span um, span A. So what sweep measures? Uh, we take on that anemometer as well as the um, temperature measurer um, for the spacecraft. Um, so measure, measures velocity distribution functions. And what a, a what a velocity distribution function is, because um, this is definitely a change from my early days when we did uh, when I did a lot of imaging. Um, was the number of particles versus speed or energy? So by ramping through uh, various voltages, we can get um, this the velocity, the speed, and the direction, um, and that's the peak of where most of the particles is is the velocity. Uh, the density is if you add up all the particles that you get. And then the temperature is actually the width um, of the um, of the, that distribution, and we can measure both the hydrogen uh, protons, which is most of the solar wind, as well as the helium, which is the next most um, excuse me next most um, uh, abundant element. And then uh, the span A ions actually has the ability to measure um, oxygen, carbon, and differentiate uh, by mass per charge. What else is um, what else is in the solar wind? So that's another thing that's going to be of great importance in the future. So again, going to going back to the solar probe cup, the thing that I spent most of uh, most of my time over the last decade um, thinking about. Uh, this is a, this is an image of uh, it just before it was uh, placed on the um, on the spacecraft, and. Uh, it's really a, a piece of a piece of art. Um, it's never, although Faraday cups have been flown since Voyager. There's a there's a, a Faraday cup on Voyager. Um, they're very sturdy. They're sometimes called re retarding potential analyzers in labs. Um, the the technology itself is pretty well known. The thing is, is that this environment is totally new. Um, and each, in order to make such sensitive measurements at such um, really uh, extreme environments needed a lot of careful engineering. So for instance, you can't use aluminum. Um, so instead there was tungsten, molybdenum, nobidium, titanium, and sapphire. I was originally promised when working on this cup that it was going to be made out of diamonds, rubies, and sapphires. And I said, sign me up. This seems like the right project for me. Um, <laughs> but in the end, the diamonds were too brittle. The diamonds were going to be this grid um, that that regulates the particles. Um, they would have wouldn't have made it through uh, through launch, and uh, the ruby just ended up not being as good a um, uh, insulator as uh, as these other uh, as we found other things. Um, and the sapphires though did stay, and they are 
Um, it's white sapphire, white lab, lab sapphire here that are standoffs um, in there. So there is white sapphires all around, um, all around the cup. So again, it's as insulators for the Faraday cage. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's a standoff uh, for the voltage. So the high voltage, you can't see me pointing, uh, the high voltage is just below that. So up to eight kilovolts go on the one below it. And then the, the other um, grids are separated by, by, sa uh, by sapphire. And another thing we, we normally do on things that don't go to these extremes um, is glue screws so that they don't shake loose while you're trying to launch things. Um, but you can't use epoxy um, at these temperatures. And so instead, everything is safety wired. So this, I am still amazed that the, uh, the person who put this together hand tied every single one of these. And by now, they probably are all baked off um, because it's because it's very it's gotten very warm. Um, but so again, very unique uh, unique things and a definitely a one of a kind type of um, instrument. Safety wiring like that is used commonly on aircraft engines and jet engines. Uh, what kind of temperatures are you finding inside the spacecraft that the wiring would be burned off? Um, over a thousand degrees Celsius. So I'm not sure. It, yeah, it, it should. I thought it was I thought it was supposed to just melt off at some point in time. And, and you know, we unfortunately we can't ever tell. It's not coming back. <laughs> Do you know from, I guess, experiments what, whether there's a lot of vibration on the spacecraft? Um, there was vibration. The, the main vibration load we care about was was uh, the Delta IV heavy that took that um, launched us into space. That was our main uh, main vibration profile. So it's um, only during the launch process that the vibration's an issue. Yeah, definitely. And mechanical isolation, or uh, excuse me, the safety wiring is only needed during launch, not after it melts away. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So yeah, at this point in time, it, it wouldn't don't don't need to worry about vibration so much. So good questions. Um, and and talking about testing, um, so norm normal testing facilities were not sufficient. Um, it was very hard to find some place that had both the heat and the particles at the same time. Um, so one of the most ingenious things that I have I've seen uh, was uh, came up with one of our optical engineers came up with this is um, these here that which like the little smokestacks on top of those. Those are IMAX film projectors. And their, their objects have been flipped so that instead of projecting outward, they actually culminate. And they were then fed into this main vacuum chamber. Um, and there's three of them that you can see here. There's actually a fourth that is oper in operation. I think it's kind of hiding behind this one. Um, those simulate the, uh, the closest approach in terms of heat or and approximate sunlight, um, the, the spectra's almost is, is close to solar for um, IMAX. And then this uh, piece of tinfoil over here is actually where the protons were faced into the cup and the cup was placed inside this um, and was able to test that at those high heaps um, and high illumination, it was able to measure protons coming into it um, and get a spectra. So this was uh, one of the test facilities. There was also a test facility um, calibration was done at Marshall Space Flight Center down at um, Huntsville, Alabama. Um, and they have a beam line, but didn't necessarily have the, the light um, exposure, the heat exposure. Um, so it was, um, there was, there is another facility in the south of France that actually takes a mount, uh, half a mountainside and, and focuses the light um, into, um, into a window um, to somewhat simulate, but every time there's a cloud, uh, you know, the spectrum changes or the, the intensity changes. Um, so this was something that was much more consistent and you could turn on and actually, you know, run tests for long periods of time versus, um, versus waiting for the weather. Do you know what kinds of temperature are reached at uh, solar collectors where they heat uh, salt as a liquid? Uh, I actually do not. I, I know that the, the I know that the French one was was built for um, nuclear testing, so I'm I'm guessing that it's it's of that nature. 
that might be an already existing source of that kind of illumination. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and more tests. Yet more tests. There was lots of lots of lots of testing. Um, so this uh, the spacecraft is put together, and the Faraday cup is uh, on the other side. Um, they are going through the solar panels and actually shining purple light on them to make sure that each individual. Um, part of the solar panel will deliver the appropriate amount of power. Um, and why this is important is unlike other spacecraft where the solar panels would just be deployed all the time, um, solar, uh, Parker actually flaps her wings, um, her solar panels, because um, when she gets too close to the sun, um, this would actually really heat up. So close to the sun, they are pulled in close, and just the very bottom few, um, I don't know if you can see on the screen resolutions, but there are, there are different sized um, solar cells down here, and those actually tilt out so that she basically just tilts out her fingers at the very bottom and is able to get enough power close to the sun, and then as, the, as she moves away from the sun, it, it, she redeploys the solar panel so that it can be more illuminated while, while she's flying away from the sun. Um, so uh, lots of care was taken that, and this is water cooled um, so that they don't uh, burn up. So this is a picture of the entire spacecraft in the fairing um, down at Kennedy, um, at Cape Canaveral, and um, on top of the booster, uh, the blue um, boxes are around the Faraday cup, Barker Solar Probe cup, um, span. A and span B, uh, those solar panels, um, as well as this thermal protection shield was another thing that needed to um, needed to happen in order for uh, us to be ready to send this spacecraft to the sun. Um, it is a carbon-carbon composite, um, much like the uh, tiles on the space shuttle. And uh, behind it, this dark uh, area is actually a water-cooled radiator um, that takes the heat from the back of this, um, of this heat shield and radiates away enough, um, enough heat that by the time you get back here where you have the antennas, um, the high gain antenna to communicate with Earth and all the instruments, um, you are actually sitting um, and basically looking at deep space. Once, you're, once you've blocked off the sun, the only really source of heat um, in that region, um, the, we actually, surprisingly enough, need survival heaters at closest approach in the back end. Um, so both of these instruments have survival heaters because as we come closest, this is efficient enough that there is no heat getting back or not enough heat to even keep these um, to, at survival temperatures. So there is survival heaters um, keeping those warm at, um, at closest approach. So this really is a culmination of 60 years of planning, multiple, multiple engineers, the hopes and dreams of so many science, scientists. Um, Dr. Parker is uh, front and center here. Um, he, is, he is the first person that NASA has named a spacecraft after um, while, while still alive. And he's an amazing, amazing man. Um, great story of perseverance. His initial, um, work on the solar wind uh, was rejected from uh, journals because it just seemed like it couldn't make sense. Um, and although the math seemed appropriate, um, he, people just didn't kind of believe that. And so uh, he persisted and eventually the editor um, went ahead and published the paper anyway. And um, all these years later, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, his story of perseverance and just being also a very, very nice, kind man, um, uh, you know, had a spacecraft uh, named after him. Um, and yeah, yeah. So getting into some of the results of all of, um, of all of that hard work, and one of which is the pictures that we've uh, taken. Um, there are many images and there's multiple press releases and there actually will be some more press releases that I unfortunately can't talk to talk about yet. Um, but December 14th 
Um, we're going to release um, more data from kind of the last few orbits. Uh, but this is a whisper image of uh, Comet new Nui's, Nui's um, and uh, just showing very, very beautiful pictures of comets. Um, another very interesting thing that uh, Whisper has done is was able to turn on near Venus. Uh, now, you know, in all of Parker, Parker's planning, there was no plan to actually study Venus. We are we are a solar wind mission. We're looking about looking at the solar wind, um, space weather, all of those other um, all of those other uh, things. But we were able to turn on around Venus and actually was able to image Venus while we were flying by. Um, so without an, a, an operating mission right now around Venus, we have been getting some data um, from, um, from Whisper, and we Whisper has also found a, um, a, the, a dust ring around Venus, um, and you can actually see the atmosphere versus the, um, versus the, uh, the land here. So it's really... It's really amazing, uh, all these images that have come of this. Um, Parker has also a, kind of an unexpected, um, an unexpected result has been uh, the fact that uh, we've really been studying a lot of dust as we go through um, the inner solar system. And we were able to, the, the dust impacts um, on the electric field antennas, um, allow us to get an impact rate, as well as some of the images in Whisper can see this, this dust, um, the dust uh, impacts. And there are three different, it's consistent with three different um, sources of dust, um, meteoroids, um, beta meteoroids, alpha meteoroids, um, and then a meteoroid stream. And so these three um, separate ones are, are the first time we've really been able to fly through all this dust. And this has implications for other um, systems, not just, uh, not just our own sun. Now getting to, um, getting to some space weather results, um, so this is uh, an image of Stereo um, Ahead, uh, which is another spacecraft um, in that ultraviolet um, light EUV um, 304 angstroms. And from this movie, it was pretty uninteresting, right? You didn't really see much, nothing. I mean, there might be a few filaments here or there, but nothing looking like those spectacular um, explosions that we saw um, earlier. Um, and so then we did a, um, a running difference image so that you actually subtract one from uh, one from the other. And you can see that there was something that seemed to head off of the sun um, in this direction early in the um, early in the uh, early in the movie. And so with this, we wanted to see if this was possibly something that Parker had flew through. This is a coronal mass ejection, or actually a streamer blowout um, coronal mass ejection, um, which is basically a very weak, um, weak one. And lo and behold, we looked at the sweep data. So this again is is different data than what we're looking. We're used. I'm used to looking at in terms of the. Um, Oh, the imaging. This is the top is the magnetic fields versus time of the total the tangential and radial velocity or um, magnetic fields, um, radial velocity scan, proton density, um, and then temperature. Mm -hmm. And these two dotted lines show where the coronal mass ejection, the first coronal mass ejection that Parker flew through, um, was located. And uh, so. The proton density um, has some changes, but has some big clumps in it. Uh, temperature kind of drops out, which is um, meaning that could could have dredged things up from deep in the atmosphere to, to throw out. Um, and then uh, the magnetic field also rotates, and there's some other uh, interesting rotations there that uh, that has some twist and some magnetic flux ropes that have gone by. Um, so this was the first uh, first coronal mass ejection that Parker has flown by. And why this is so amazing um, is the fact that when initial um, initial plans were made, uh, it was thought that Parker might fly through five in its um, seven year mission. And we ended up uh, flying through five within the first, um, within about the first year. So this is a very uh, different environment. Uh, coronal mass ejections, you know, there was a lot of discussion in writing this paper 
as to um, what is a corona mass ejection, uh, how big does it have to be, um, what are we what are we doing with that kind of inner um, everything in the inner heliosphere and all that activity, how do we really see that at Earth and, and how can we learn more? So Parker really had already really changed um, how we're thinking about this. So kind of what's next for um, Parker? So November 21st, um, just about a little under, just about a week away, um, breaks her own speed and distance record. Um, she will be 13 solar radii from the center of the sun and be at 163 kilometers per second. Um, so I I get a cake or I I make myself a cake every time that we we break this. So so this is my third cake, I think, uh, third or fourth cake. Um, and then there you're, is- You baked uh, it in the solar oven? Excuse me, in solar oven. I should. Um, I well, yes, <laughs> I should. But no, I just, I just eat cake. <laughs> the uh, perihelions. There's a couple of perihelions at this distance, and then another Venus assist. So we go through um, seven v Venus assists in order to, um, in order to break our our distance records and speed records. Um, so we have a Venus flyby six on August 21st of 23. And then the final Venus flyby November 6th of 2024, and the closest approach um, in 12, uh, December of 2025. Um, and uh, so, unfortunately, uh, we the, there was no other Venus that we can encounter um, after that. Uh, I think it's actually. I think it takes almost 100 years before we could um, contact Venus again or, or use Venus for a flyby. So it doesn't work. This is as close as we can get, but it is. it has been just an absolutely um, amazing mission so far with, again, um, in, in uh, December, there's going to be even more uh, excitement about this mission. And this is really why I do all of this. Um, and this is this was taken at the Air and Space Museum just after um, just after we launched and this little girl came over to me and asked me so what do you do and i say i study the sun and she was like i want to go to space and so we sat and we talked about the sun and we talked about what parker did and after this picture was taken she laid down and she's like i'm going to space like parker um and so you know this is this is why i do it is to get folks excited to um to do the cool science and the amazing engineering that happened but also uh, to really excite the next generation so with that, I am happy to take any questions. Um, I'm going to stop sharing just so I can see y'all because <laughs> I can't see anything else. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Kelly. That was that was terrific. Um, uh, Jay, I know you had another question in the queue somewhere here. Uh, do you want to ask? Uh, let me scroll back, but uh, maybe you got the answer. OK. Is energy density greater or is it just more rarefied particles are individually faster? Um, so the rarefied particles are, they're all individually faster as well. So like the, for, so for energetic particles, yeah, they're, they're all just individually faster. So the question was whether the density justified the higher temperature or the speed of the particles alone justified the temperature speed alone or the all right you're gonna have to do Temper that again it's late well, it's late on a <laughs> it's it's late on a sunday <laughs> when i if i heat up a, 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 a right. ball of air yeah that's gonna be hot but it's yeah. not gonna it i mean the energy in it is a lot lower than if i beat up heat up a bottle of water to the right. same temperature right yes you're right it is it is less dense so hold on, let me, <laughs> it's late. George. Yep, George. Nope, I gotta unmute you there. Can you, George, can you unmute? All right, uh, I'm unmuted. Uh, particles fly off the spacecraft, right? Uh, it's not only the particles from the sun, but don't you get some debris from the spacecraft? Does this affect your instrument in any way? I mean, how do you deal with that? So, um, so in terms of the dust, um, there have been impacts in the um, on the on the heat shield, and um, as far as you know, we have not we don't have any cameras up front, unfortunately. So we don't have any cameras on um, on the on the cup, and so as far as we know the cup 
has has not had any change in operations. Um, so it doesn't seem to be um, affecting it. Now, of course, you know there are, you know, there are there are other scenarios, but right now there's nothing that has a, has affected the cup. Um, the cup also bakes off a lot when it goes that close. That most things, um, yeah, most things are baked off. Hey, Elizabeth, you want to ask a question? You're muted. You're muted. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to get her off uh, the mute there. Um, I'll, I'll ask one here and see if Elizabeth there can. There we go. There we go. go. I, I think I'm trying to Can you hear me? Yeah. It's not trivial, believe me. <laughs> we can hear you poorly, so don't move around while you're speaking. Okay, I have my laptop. Um, not my laptop, my iPad. Anyway, what's going to happen after it's over? Does it just disintegrate or land into the sun, fly into the sun? What's the future? Right. Yeah. So we we tried to engineer something that like something got ejected into the sun, but unfortunately that takes a lot of change in angular momentum and there just won't be any fuel left. Um, so what will happen is um, we actually have fuel for probably another 10 to 15 years after the 2025 time frame, but when that fuel that keeps the the sunshade pointed at the at the sun runs out, um, the uh, spacecraft will eventually turn. It will catch on fire uh, slash burn up, and um, and then just become a ball of rock, you know, of metal, kind of uh, circling the sun, at, orbiting the sun at the closest approach. A lump of molten slag. Yes. What's the uh, Kelly? What's the uh, what were your what were you did you design it for a ten year mission or I know you launched in eighteen or nineteen eighteen yeah we we designed it for the seven year mission um, seven. yeah because uh, because uh, you know you don't want to drive you don't want to drive cost by trying to design something that's going to last for twenty right. years so um, well designed for seven years will you know should last then pass that um, and if we're lucky enough. Um, and so now I'm, you know, now I have my sweep hat on, not my NASA headquarters hat, but my sweep hat is like, hopefully it'll last for the next, you know, 10 to 15 years afterwards. The NASA headquarters people might have something else to say about that. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely>. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other, one other quick one from you. I know you said that you were, that we were surprised by the uh, discovery of the dust, right? In the inner solar system that was kind of new and didn't, didn't expect to detect it, I guess, or. Well, uh, so we, um. We didn't have a dust detector on board um, or on as an as part of the instrument package, and we expected that there would be dust there, but we did not quite know exactly what the dust was going to be. Um, and so, to be able to clearly pick it up with the um, with the antennas um, was a great, uh, and then the image or imagery is a great kind of extra bonus science. Um, to get there. Uh, so again, we, we expected some dust. We just didn't know that we'd be able to separate three populations of dust. Okay. Are there any other, I guess you can't reveal what's coming out in, in your literature, but, um, you know, are you surprised by other things you've, you've, uh, you know, discovered or, or studied as, has anything like really said, wow, that was not at all what I thought I'd see. Um, I definitely think that the number, just the number of um, ejections, various, um, you know, things that we've seen uh, in terms of space weather has been a surprise. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's definitely, um, yeah, the, the thing on the, the 14th will be, is, is kind of a little bit of a surprise. Um, okay. So that's is something looking for, forward to sharing. And uh, yeah. Oh, good. Well, we'll have to have George explain it to us, I guess, when it when it yeah. comes out. Let's <laughs> invite Kelly back. Yeah, we'll have Kelly back. Yeah. 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 Um, anyone else have questions? We have a few minutes left. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Okay, we'll go to we'll go back to Jay and and then George. I uh, wondered, you, you use the term dust, 
I assume that the dust of the sun is mostly atomic, not molecular, and that it uh, represents the ambient molecular uh, atomic structure of the the universe in in the solar system. Uh, how does that work? And the other question was, how long can you man the or manage the program? Yes. So, um, so in terms of the dust, the dust is what the the primordial dust cloud that all the sun was was formed out of. Um, so whatever was left over by the first generation of stars that that created this one, um, that's the bits that we're getting um, with with Parker and kind of at that because as because you, you're right, it, you know, dust or molecules tend to dissociate as you get closer and warmer. Um, so you end up with atoms um, and uh, hitting the um, hitting uh, the antennas and, and disturbing them and giving us our little signals. Um, and in terms of managing the program, uh, you know, seven years was the nominal mission for NASA. Um, then the next 10 to 15 are based on how many maneuvers need to be done. Um, and again, at current estimation, estimations, it's about 10, 10 more years. Uh, that will then be based on funding um, as to how, how long that can be managed. Um, and that is still above my pay grade. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm sure that folks are, I'm sure other folks are working on that. As far as the dust, uh, is there a distillation process that occurs at the surface of the sun so that you may not be getting representative of the entire average atomic structure, uh, sampling of the sun, but only what's, what floats to the surface and gets cast off by the energy? Right. Um, and so we are getting hits versus, you know, unfortunately, we can't say that, oh, this is silicon or, oh, this is, you know, sulfur or whatever. Um, it is it is simply a uh, an impact. Um, so there there probably is some type of um, distillation as you go in closer and then a dust free zone um, as you get in close enough that everything will be dissociated, um, warm enough to be dissociated. Um, so, so yeah, so we don't have great information on exactly what the chemical composition is, but we do know the intensity, um, intensity of impacts. Paul, you're muted. Paul, you're muted. I'm oh, sorry, uh, George, you had a question? Joey, you, you showed that really nice picture of a mirror from high C with yes. you standing over it. That mirror is taking the highest resolution in EUV images of the sun yet, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the, what, a six-inch mirror? Um, that was a, uh, we were 22-inch rocket skin, so we were, we were about that big, 14 inches. For, okay, but didn't you, wasn't the, you had to worry about mounting that mirror and if you didn't stress it and, and ruin the curvature. Was the rocket placed on the mirror? Yes. So we instead of a mirror um, being put in the rocket, the rocket is lowered onto the mirror. Right. Yeah. Normally, you you have the rocket tube, and then you just kind of stick yeah. the mirror on one end. Um, yeah. For this, we actually had to create a mount where the rocket was standing, and um, you laid underneath it, <laughs> and and uh, mounted it from the from from the bottom, so that there was equal gravity on all parts of the mirrors. So any of the the five flexures that held it in place nice. um, was giving the same amount of gravity. Versus if you were to mount it vertically, you have a different amount of gravity from here to uh, from the top to the bottom. Um, so there was a lot of very sensitive uh, engineering that went into that one too. I guess I find myself <laughs> in, in very, very complicated engineering problems. Yeah. Okay, I see Elizabeth. I don't know if you have another question or just, just your, uh, just need to close your hand there, but anybody else, uh, any, any other questions? Um, I guess, Kelly, can you give us a sense, just practically speaking, what happened the last few weeks? I know we had space weather kind of going on. Tell us about that a little bit, if you could. Definitely, definitely. So um, earlier this, uh, well, I guess last month, uh, October, just before Halloween, uh, there was an X-Class flare. So X-Class is 
um, how much uh, x-rays you're seeing. Um, and so this is a large, a large amount of x-rays, the largest classification we have. Um, and that, uh, that happened on the sun that created the coronal mass ejection as well as the particles that came towards the earth. Um, those particles hit, um, kind of a little later than we thought. We thought they would come streaming towards uh, towards the earth uh, very quickly and hit on Halloween. And although some hit on Halloween, a lot of them um, kind of came a day or two uh, later than we thought. Um, and so that was unique and a lot and sent a lot of people scratching their heads as to why that was happening. Um, so it's uh, again, another uh, another data point for us to really start to understand uh, how the space weather thing works. So uh, Kelly, it was really fantastic having you. Uh, you know, uh, George, George does a lot of work getting speakers. He has a nice collection of, of names and contacts and uh, mm -hmm. you're certainly one of the one of the, one of them at the top of that list. And I really appreciate the time you gave us tonight, you know, prepping for it and, uh, you know, for spending a good hour little more than an hour here with us. So uh, thank you again for, for, for coming and sharing your insight and uh, best of luck. I, I'm really looking forward to the data and I, as I know you, you are as well. So thank, thanks, Kelly. Definitely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Cool.